Wait. There you go. <laughs> the cord had come out. Well, who knew? Okay. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> it's great to be with you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's always such a blessing to be here. And uh, Kirk, seeing as you're watching, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, the last time I was with you, um, I did speak about how vital perseverance is in our walk with the Lord. And I really want us to just think a little bit more about that and the outworking of trials in our lives today. But before we get there, I want to pray because I always say it's a lot better to pray before asking God's help than to pray after him to fix things. So um, with that in mind, let's pray and hopefully my microphone will stop going in and out. Yeah. <laughs> Father God, we just thank you so very much for your hand upon us today. Lord, I pray that I'd not get in the way of what you plan to do, but that Holy Spirit you would be the one to minister to us today in every single word that goes forth. May it accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So perseverance is vital to our walk with the Lord. And last time we were together, we looked at a couple of different things that will help us to persevere no matter what comes our way in life. And if you remember, we noted the importance of storing up God's word in our hearts to carry us and others through times of trial that will most certainly come to us. God's word also emphasized, if you remember, the need to look at things from God's perspective, and it also confirmed the need for us to be united together in the body of Christ if we are to persevere as we ought. One of the first things that God said about mankind in the Garden of Eden was that it was not good for man to be alone. We are created for community. The one thing that we cannot forget, though, is that true strength is given to those who are determined to dwell in the presence of the King of Kings. And no matter what season of life we find ourselves in, we must remember that we can boldly approach God's throne of grace with confidence to find help in our time of need. Now, last time we were together, if you were here or watched it online, you'll remember that I told you one of my African This morning, Kirk said to me that I was to have some fun with you. And so I figured that uh, I'd tell you another shorter story today. And I can see some of you are breathing a sigh of relief at the shorter part. But... Um, Colin and I used to live in a country called Botswana. We were there for a long time. And while we were there, we often went on safari. We would travel on the vaguest of trails in the bush, trails that, in fact, would not even be considered roads here. But we were determined to find the most remote areas. Sometimes we didn't see other people for days on our trips. And on one adventure in the middle of the African rainy season, when traveling is even more treacherous, we set out along one of those paths, ignoring the advice of park rangers that we had met, who told us that no one had been along that way, that particular track, for over a week. In fact, the park rangers had been the last people to attempt it, and their vehicle had gotten stuck in thick mud along the way. Undeterred, however, we set out and we did exceptionally well until we were around about the halfway point. And we disappeared into a flooded area the size of a small know this, but Africa bush law teaches that when faced with a wet dirt road, is always through the water, never around. You see, the compact 
is a harder surface to drive on, even though covered with water, than the soft earth which surrounds the track. So before I even get any further in my, um, in my story, we're going to switch microphones here. Okay? I think this will be a lot better. Hopefully, it won't go in and out. So I want you to remember, though, you're on the edge of your seat at this point <laughs> because we're sitting there faced with this lake before us. As we sat there, this vast water stretching out into the distance, Colin decided to get out of the truck and do his Moses impersonation. But unfortunately, the water did not part. So he walked out into the watery expanse to test the road beneath it. Well, he got about thigh deep when he says something nipped him on the calf. And I'm telling you, he turned round and shot out of the water back in the direction of our four-wheel vehicle. He jumped in the cab and slammed the door shut in case whatever it was had decided to follow him. As we sat there, wondering what to do, we noticed faint tracks disappearing into the bush on our left. So thinking that perhaps someone had cut an alternate route, we decided to ignore the bushcraft that we knew to follow the tracks. It wasn't long before we realized that we were actually following the path left by the ill-fated ranger's vehicle, which had got stuck the week before. We were just within a few feet of returning to the main track again, the other side of the lake, when we drove over the termite mound. And you know what I'm going to say, don't you? It collapsed. And there we were, our four-wheel drive buried to the axle in mud. We were miles from anywhere, in thick bush, surrounded by wild animals, which included lion. No one had traveled that road for a week, and no one was expected any time soon. The place where we'd got stuck was covered with scrub, and so, with no trees to tie onto, our winch was useless. The only thing that we could do was to start digging. Now, to this day, I maintain that I got the side that the ants were on because I was soon covered with their fiery bites. You know, there's nothing quite like digging a vehicle out of a wet termite heap to change your perspective on life. It took us seven hours to get free. And by the end of it, I knew what the Bible says to be true. Beauty is fleeting. <laughs> I never expected to be covered in mud, bitten by ants, nails broken, hair awry, but it happened just the same. Well, the end result was that after a lot of praying, we did finally get free. And more importantly, we lived to tell the tale of it. God very graciously, though, brought a group of researchers along the road from the opposite direction. Unfortunately, they only arrived moments after we had got ourselves free of the mud. But they were able to encourage us about the road that lay ahead of us now. And as they drove away, wouldn't you know it? They followed that watery road right through the middle of the lake and out the other side. The exact thing that we should have done. Now, I want you to know that that day taught us things we never knew before, about ourselves, about the bush, and about the faithfulness of God. And quite honestly, we were all the better for it. And it gave us a testimony of God's faithfulness to share with others. Now, I know that by now you're sitting there thinking, well, that's really a very interesting story, but what's your point? And you'd be very glad to know I do have one. <laughs> Life is like that sometimes. 
Things seem to be going so well when suddenly we get confronted by something quite awful, even frightening, something that we really didn't expect, something that we'd far rather go around, and yet God so often seems to say to us, go through. Today, I want to share a few things that I think will help us make sense of trials when they occur, as they most certainly will. Now, I know that some Christians feel that hard times really aren't fair, and that as believers, if God really loved us, we just shouldn't have them, right? But that line of thought really is not biblical, For Jesus clearly warned us against thinking like that, saying in John 16, verse 33, that in this world we will have trouble, but we can take heart, finding peace in him because he has overcome the world. Trials come to us all. And The reason that they do is actually because they can be used by God for great good. One of my favorite scriptures as it relates to the things we suffer in life is what Paul reassures us in Romans 8 verse 28. He says there that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Now, in God's loving hand, even our trials can become great blessings as he uses them to draw us to himself and to make us more like Christ. But for us to truly experience the blessings that are available, we really do need to bring certain attitudes to the trials that we face. Paul mentions love for Christ there in verse 28. But life has taught me that faith and trust and patience should also be part of the mix as well. I first learned this concept of all things working together when I was in high school. I was running late one day, desperately needing caffeine, and so I grabbed a handful of ground coffee and threw it in my mouth as I headed out the door, you see? There is wisdom right there. She's shaking her head, no. (laughs) Wrong move. It was terrible, right? I had no idea that coffee grounds by themselves would be so horrible. They need the addition of some other things like water, cream, perhaps even sugar to be palatable and useful. The same can be true of trials and hardships that we face in life. On their own, they may be bitter indeed, but they can be used for God's glory and our good if they're mixed together with faith, trust, and patience. I had the opportunity to share that very story at a maximum security prison not long ago. Afterwards, a prisoner who said that he was serving three life sentences without the possibility of parole came up and spoke to me and he said that he had seen this to be true in his own life. He told me that after serving 27 years of his sentence, a new law was passed that made him eligible for a parole interview. In the time that he had been in prison, he had become a Christian. And so he saw his potential release as being really God's kindness to him for the transformation that had occurred in his life. He said that his interview before the parole board went extremely well, and they even commended him for how his life had changed during his time in prison. And yet, they denied his parole, saying that they believed that he still had some work to do, but they encouraged him to reapply again for another interview in four years' time. 
you know, at first he said that he was absolutely devastated. He couldn't understand why God had allowed that to happen, to set him up for it to just all be taken away from him. And at first he was really angry with the Lord for disappointing him in that way. But he soon realized that it was foolish to turn his back on God, who was really, after all, the only one who could really help him. He continued to serve the Lord and began to work on the recommendations of the parole board. It was then, he said, that other prisoners began to approach him, explaining that the way he dealt with his disappointment had made them realize that Jesus was real and that he was no longer the man that he used to be. He was able to lead many of those same men to Jesus Christ, to accept him as Lord and Savior. And so he told me, you know, when the board rejected my application, I first thought that it was all about me. I was so disappointed and I questioned God's love. Why had he allowed this to happen? But then when the men started surrendering to God one after another, I realized that God was saying, it wasn't just about me. He was working in their lives and in their stories too. And I was to be a part of that. For as I struggled through my own disappointment, they came to see Jesus for who he really is. He had even come to praise God that his parole was denied, he said, because the Lord had used his hardship to bring others to faith. His testimony was that God really does work all things together for good. Those who belong to Jesus Christ should never doubt God's love. He is able to use everything that concerns us for his glory and for our ultimate good. Paul even reveals in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, that we can rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. We can rejoice in the fact that God has purpose in our pain. For as we persevere through life's difficulties, they have a way not only of bringing us closer to God, but they also keep us with him as we depend solely upon him for strength. Trials have the capability of conforming us to the character of Christ. In other words, they have the potential to change us for the better, making us more like him, giving us a deeper hope in God's faithfulness and in his love. And as we encounter him in our circumstances, the testimony that that gives us can then be shared with others to give them hope in their time of need as well. From the very beginning of my journey um, with Christ, I've really seen this principle of perseverance producing character and hope to be true. Colin, my husband, and I battled with infertility. We believed that God could give us children, but nine years passed and still our arms were empty. It was difficult. The tests were humiliating. The disappointments were many. Every person I ever prayed for fell pregnant, but not me. We had graciously listened to every piece of well-meaning advice, and we'd repented of every sin known to man. In fact, we'd even repented of some sins I think are not known to man. <laughs> and still nothing. We continued to walk with the Lord, though, and we finally reached that point of being willing to trust the Lord whether he gave us children or not. We reached the point of saying to him, Lord, thy will be done. And then 
I was suddenly pregnant. At around 10 weeks, though, I threatened to miscarry, and I was put on bed rest for almost two months. Although the initial threat of miscarriage was averted, I became more and more unwell as the pregnancy progressed. Towards the end, I was in hospital more time than I was out, and I wondered why God was not healing me. I knew that he could, but apparently he chose not to. I think that was really the hardest thing in it all. But I never gave up on God's word. I was in it every day. And one morning, as I sat in my hospital bed with my open Bible, I noticed a scripture that I don't think I'd ever seen before. It was in Psalm 77, verse 19. There the psalmist is seeking comfort from God. And so he remembers his mighty works from long ago. And he speaks of when God led his people under Moses. And as the psalmist remembers, he remembers the crossing of the Red Sea. And there in verse 17, he says something quite remarkable. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. And as I sat there in my hospital bed for the first time, I understood what it took for those people to continue to follow God despite their circumstances. Surely they would have preferred a boat, a bridge, a way around, but God said, go through. And more than that, his footprints were not seen going ahead of them. I felt the Lord tell me, just because I couldn't see his footprints in the sand, it didn't mean that he had abandoned me. He was just asking me to follow him by faith and not by sight. If you think about the crossing of the Red Sea, God not only protected his people, he revealed himself to them in ways that they had not known before. Not only that, but as they stood giving thanks to him on the other side, the Lord used the same water of their deliverance for the destruction of the enemy that pursued them. If only we could see our own trials in that same way. Well, things didn't immediately improve for me after that encounter with God's word because after several more weeks in hospital, I went on to have an emergency C-section at 35 weeks when my blood pressure rose to 220 over 120. I was at risk of having an aneurysm, and I remember saying to the doctor, but what about the baby? And he told me, if we don't take the child now, we are going to lose you. Once the operation was performed, I went immediately into intensive care, and my son, Stephen, went into the NICU. He weighed just less than four pounds, but against all odds, he was fine. I think it's God's special wink to me that he is now an officer in the Marine Corps. (laughs) A few months later, though, um, a woman at church, she was watching me sit with Stephen, and she asked me if he would be our Isaac, meaning our one and only son. And I told her that God already knew that I would love a little Megan, But that I told the Lord I couldn't have another pregnancy like I had with Stephen. When Stephen was just eight months old, against the doctor's recommendation, I unexpectedly found myself pregnant again. Praise God, to the great surprise of the specialists, that pregnancy was totally normal. And without any of my previous health complications, our daughter Megan was born full term and perfect in every way. And I love that because now as I look back, I realize that we actually have two miracle babies. 
despite the fact that God had led me down a path I would never have chosen for myself, my hope in him was not misplaced. He proved faithful, and more than that, he gave me a testimony to be shared, a testimony that brings hope to others. Now, I know from my own experiences that things don't always turn out as happily as we expect. And, you know, it gets especially difficult when those challenges pile up one after another, as they sometimes do. But it's in times like that that true faith is proved and grown as we cling to God. The past five years of my own life have been rather like that. I was diagnosed with cancer and had to undergo two major surgeries. At the same time, my sister-in-law was also told that she had a similar cancer to mine, but hers was already stage four, and she did not survive. At the same time, my husband, Colin, was diagnosed with a very dangerous blood disorder, and it had to be treated with chemotherapy. During his treatment, he was bitten on the back by a poisonous spider and came within hours of dying of sepsis, but the doctors at Los Robles saved him. Unfortunately, at that time, in the midst of all of my husband's illness and our trials, I was restructured out of a job that I loved. It wasn't long before Colin was hospitalized again. This time, he was critically ill with pneumonia. Thankfully, he pulled through yet again, and so we decided we'd go on a trip, just the two of us, to Hawaii only to find ourselves in the middle of the path of Hurricane Lane. Do you remember Hurricane Lane? Thankfully, it turned at the last minute, but it wasn't much fun locked in that hotel room when we really should have been lying on a beach, right? Seemingly robbed of that vacation, a couple of months later, we decided that we would go on another short trip to celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary. And actually, it was such a blessing, even though Colin seemed to sleep through much of it. Each meal, we would talk about what we loved about one another, about the things that we'd never regretted, and about how we'd seen God's faithfulness and how he'd worked in us and through us, changing us for the better over the years. Colin fell ill on the way home from that trip, and we at first thought it was pneumonia again. But as it turned out, his blood disorder had transitioned into acute myeloid leukemia. Eight days after we got back, he passed into the arms of Jesus. And I started down a road that I would never have chosen for myself. Some of you know that my daughter Megan was recently married and her brother, who is an officer in the Marine Corps, was supposed to walk her down the aisle. But because of COVID, he couldn't come. He was in Virginia and unable to travel. And so again, I had to go down a path that I would never have expected as I walked my own daughter down the aisle. It hasn't been easy. And yet, despite all of this, I can stand here today and tell you quite honestly that God is good, even in this. Amen. Because, you see, through it all, God has been faithful. He has fought for us. He's ministered to us. He has changed us. And perhaps I learned long ago in that hospital bed when I was pregnant, that though we have trials, though we have problems, God is not one of our problems. You see, the truth is the Bible tells me that he loves me, that he is for me, 
that he has good plans for me. His plans are to prosper me and not to harm me. Plans to give me a future and a hope. My pain is not wasted and neither is yours. For he is working all things together for our eventual good. He's developing his character in us. You know, I'm not as troubled as I used to be about things that used to bother me before. People and relationships somehow are more important now. I have a compassion for others that I never used to. Less pride, I guess, too. And what I've noticed is that People actually want to talk to me about the tough stuff that's going on in their lives. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because they believe that I will understand somehow. It seems that going through what I have done has given me a voice I never had before. And I'm able to share the hope that can only be found in Jesus with others as they go through their own times of difficulty. I am living proof that God is a good shepherd to his sheep. And though we walk through the valley, valleys are not a place to camp, for he will lead us through them if we stick close to him. There are times that things happen that we really just cannot control or understand, things that make no sense. During that time, uh, for example, uh, just after Colin died, I got two kittens because I didn't want to be in the house alone, right? And within the month, both of those small kittens died of some disease that they apparently contracted at the pound. I want to tell you that I have never really understood why that happened and what the purpose of that was. But then, you know, the truth is that the the Bible tells us that the disciples didn't understand everything of Christ purposes either. You know, they didn't always understand what he said or what he did. And in fact, on one occasion, in John chapter 6, a lot of Christ's followers actually turned away from him, unwilling to stick with him because something he said to them. But Jesus then turned to the 12, and in John 6, verses 67 to 69, he asks them, do you want to leave too? Simon Peter then answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, we need to be willing to follow Christ no matter what comes our way in life, whether we get our way or we don't. When times of trial come, though, I've learned that why is not a helpful question. It's better to ask what and how. Lord, what do you want me to learn about you from this, and how can I use it for your kingdom? So as the band comes up, I want to encourage you. If you've been struggling recently If you faced some things that honestly you would really rather not have faced, some things that you can't understand, if you've been discouraged about the way things have gone and you can't discern God's footprints, remember what Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, But on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, 
But what is unseen is eternal. We have so much to thank God for this Thanksgiving, for He is preparing us through our trials for His glory. Our troubles here on earth are momentary when compared with an eternity with Him. And until we see Him face to face, He has promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. When our hope is in Him, ultimately, we will not be disappointed.